Hello, welcome to the Path 11 podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. I am also the co-founder of Path 11 Productions. And aside from podcasting, we also make great films and documentaries, which can be found at path11productions.com. We have a special promo code just for our podcast listeners. The promo code is Path 11 Podcast. And if you go to our website, path11productions.com, and visit our shop page, put that promo code in and you will receive 50% off of our Evolution DVD, which is the third film in our Path Trilogy series. If you would like to become a sponsor of the Path 11 Podcast, please email me at info at path11productions.com. And now for this week's show. So today I'm joined with Ira Israel, who is the author of How to Survive Your Childhood Now That You're an Adult. A licensed marriage and family therapist and professional clinical counselor, Ira graduated from the University of Pennsylvania and holds advanced degrees in psychology, philosophy, and religious studies. His DVD series, including A Beginner's Guide to Happiness and Mindfulness for Depression, along with his sold-out Esalen workshops, has given him a wide international following. He lives in Santa Monica, California, and we'd like to welcome him to our show. Hi, Ira. Hi, April. Thank you very much for having me on today. Yeah. So I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, your recent book, How to Survive Your Childhood Now That You're an Adult, A Path to Authenticity and Awakening. And uh, it was actually towards the back of your book that you also brought out a quote that said, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. And I thought that that was pretty cool. Now, I also know in learning about you that in 1985, you really had a life-changing moment through a car accident that kind of led you and pushed you into where you are now. So I was hoping that you can bring our listeners through a little bit of your personal background and story uh, so they can better understand why you're doing the work that you're doing here today. Absolutely. So in 1985, um, there was a car accident. I was in the passenger seat and I was very badly hurt. Um, and it set me off on a journey uh, that I didn't know I was going on at the time, but, you know, asking the questions, what's the meaning of life? Who am I? What is this all about? And I ended up studying philosophy um, for about t- 10 years after that. And then um, I was in Thailand and I got hurt. And after um, uh, it was a very interesting experience, but essentially a woman healed me with her hands and all the things that I had been studying for previously seemed like, wow, maybe there's another way of seeing the world. So I ended up studying Buddhism, Hinduism, Kabbalah, um, mindfulness, yoga for about eight years after that. And then, um, I got really interested in psychology. So it was a 25 year journey that was, uh, set into motion by this car accident. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, basically I was in an out of bed in the hospital for two years. So I had a lot of time to read and watch movies and do things. Uh, and, um, yeah, I started asking those questions that people ask and, uh, you know, I, it took me some time. I'm not proud uh, that it took me 20, 25 years to find the answers, but, um, you know, I've been teaching for the last eight or nine years at Esalen and, uh, you know, I love what I do. Great. Thank you. And so part of the reason for you writing this book is really trying to get people to live and be more of their true authentic self. So, you know, a lot of the book is about authenticity and, um, and really, I, I haven't found really anyone that hasn't had something to survive in their childhood, you know, with some of the clients that I work with as well. And we will kind of, you know, turn back to, you know, what is their story? What impacted them a lot? And, you know, many times we kind of move into the adult world and we kind of play stuff out that we were conditioned to and what we learned when we were, were children and trying to clean that up as adults. Mm -hmm. So, um, can you talk a little bit about that? My basic premise is that as sentient beings, the one thing we desire above all is to be loved unconditionally. And we grew up in this crazy society, very competitive, that only gave us tools to gain love conditionally because we get good grades, because we do well in school, and we're, we, we're wealthy, we speak well, we, we vacation in exotic places. And we're constantly seducing people into liking 
our false selves, our facades, our outer selves. But what we really want is them to um, love our, you know, our, our somewhat messy or unseemly, you know, inner selves. And that's the interesting thing. So we develop a false self in order to survive our childhood and try to get our emotional and psychological needs met the best we can as children. And we should be very happy about whatever way of being we created when we were seven or 13 years old because it worked. And we know it worked because we're here today. But whatever tools or defense mechanisms that we learned when we were a child are probably hindering us from getting the authentic love that we want as adults. So that's why um, I wrote this book because, you know, I noticed there's 23 million Americans who take antidepressants every morning, and there's an epidemic of uh, anxiety and stress also. So, you know, I, 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 I thought, wait, hey, maybe there's not some rogue gene for depression that, you know, afflicts Americans. Maybe um, it's uh, our school system. Maybe it's capitalism. Maybe it's romantic love. Maybe, um, you know, it's just growing up in this society where all the things that we consider to be normal, you know, we're, are going to be looked back on in 300 years as uh, as prehistoric, really. So um, that's why I, I wrote the book, and I hope that um, the the first six chapters, where I deconstruct uh, authenticity, really raises consciousness around again all the things that you and I just consider to be normal, whether it's root canals or asphalt, or you know going to Cancun to vacation, you know all of these things that we consider to be normal at some point in time will be considered completely absurd and even maybe uh, deleterious. Yeah, and it was really early on. It was only on page three, but one of the first things that I highlighted in your book that I really loved, you know, you kind of spoke about it right there, is that, you know, when we're children, we learn how to get admired, but do we know how to be loving, lovable, and loved? Yeah, there's no courses. It's, it's, it's astonishing to me because the only thing that correlates strongly with happiness is the quality of our intimate relationships. And our school system was designed to, to produce factory workers, you know, essentially. And as you and I both know, if you look at the DSM and you you try to understand, you know, there's no definition of wellness in our society. But if you carefully take apart the language of the Diet uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Disorders, what you'll find is that our barometer of well-being revolves around work. Can you show up for your job? And if you can't show up for your job, then the pharmaceuticals have the pharmaceutical companies have some pills that'll help you show up for your job. So, you know, th th this is totally absurd. Nobody wants work really hard on their tombstone. And yet when you talk to people in the grocery store, you know, they're like, oh, I'm crazy busy. I work 80 hours a week. I have no work-life balance. I haven't done this in 10 years, blah, blah, blah. And we're addicted to busy in our culture. And that's why there's one ch chapter called Taking Care of Busyness Business, because, you know, there's not a lot of us who are curing leukemia, you know, or, and doing things that are incredibly stressful where it's life and death ev every day. But, you know, there's this weird self-righteousness about work and, and, and earning money in our society. And the, that's what I'm saying causes depression and anxiety, because what we really need is hugs. We don't need 200 Facebook likes. We don't need um, half of the things that we think we need. What we really need is to, you know, uh, sit around on Sunday morning and drink coffee and read the paper with a loved one and hold hands, take a walk on the beach. Yeah, you gave an example, too, um, in the book, and I don't have it uh, totally pulled up here word for word, but about, um, you know, maybe somebody that wanted to just lay in bed all day and, you know, right. eat popcorn eat or lollipops. Right. Eat, yeah. We and, would consider you know, them and, mentally ill. We would say, what's wrong with you? If you if you spent two weeks, the example in the book is if someone spent two weeks in bed watching reality television or something, and maybe the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, if you do anything for money, it it, it, it it it, it 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 really is not it causes misery uh, to be <laughs> to be frank if you do something no matter how much you're making and you don't want to do it if it's not your heart's desire if you're not called to do it, it you're going to be miserable no matter how much the money is you can't you know um uh, fool your mind into thinking oh i should be doing this and you know blah 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 so the word vocation features very prominently in the book because voco in latin means calling so what i'm telling people to do is 
uh, tune in to what the universe is telling you about what your heart's desire is, whether it's painting or helping others or teaching or hiking or, you know, we really need to um, re-envision the way we think about happiness and our lives because, you know, the things that we learn through pop culture in school, I'm, I'm advocating uh, or I'm, I'm proposing might be the underlying sources of, of some of our misery. And as a, just a basic example, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's ironic that we live in a country where uh, we have the inalienable right to pursue happiness. And what I argue in the book is that that's a surefire way to misery. Uh, if you pursue happiness, you're always going to be disappointed or you'll attain it and then it'll eclipse and then you'll be sad again. So what you need to do is just have practices because happiness is actually a byproduct. And it happens, as I say in the book, I quote Mick Brown and say, when it's, it, it often happens when it's least expected. So you can't aim for happiness. You should just have a wide array of tools that happen to keep people at the high end of their happiness spectrums. Yes, I would agree too. It, you know, because that is there's such a false sense of that that's what we're all here to attain. You know, is is the sense of happiness. I think there's moments. There's definitely moments, and um, and those are great moments. But to maintain this level, and you know, many many clients, and I'm sure that you hear this too. You know, upon intake, you know, asking them about some of their goals. Well, you know, why are you here? What is it that you're hoping to achieve? I just want to be happy. You know, I hear that a lot and it's like, okay, well, um, but you know, it's, it's just so I don't get off too much on a tangent, you know, in talking about authenticity, you also said that we have to kind of go into what is also inauthentic and look mm -hmm. at that first. So can you talk about that? Sure. As I said, we develop a false self in order to survive our childhoods. And what I have people do is take a look at their way of being in the world. And, you know, when I break down authenticity, I, I break it down in the book into attachment, atonement, attunement, presence, and congruence. So attachment is just attachment theory. And there's a beautiful quote by um, Harville Hendricks that helps explicate why this is so important. He says that the subconscious purpose of marriage in America is to enable us to complete our childhoods. Our parents had deficits. Those deficits wounded us. Those wounds became defense mechanisms, and those defense mechanisms became our personalities. And we'll always be attracted to people who can replicate the dynamics from one or more of our primary caregivers. So there's a wounded child in us that, as I said before, that wants to be loved unconditionally. And it could be 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years later where um, people are doing things and they're basically trying to appease the people who they think the wounded child in them failed to get to love them when they were six or seven years old. So attachment theory and understanding like um, certain tra traumatizing events in a, in a childhood, in your childhood is super important because a child's mind basically when anything goes wrong in the area says there's something wrong with me. And, you know, th there's a defense mechanism that put in place where um, the mind says, wow, that was really humiliating. That was really awful. I'm never going to let that happen again. I'm going to become rich. I'm going to become famous. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So the phrase from the book, which I, which I have to um, open up a little bit, is um, we become what we love and we'll be, we become what we hate and both are inauthentic. So again, if we're, if we're 45, 50 years old and we're stry still trying to retroactively get the approval, acceptance and love from you know our, our first grade teacher or our older brother and sister, that's inauthentic. And then if we uh, get a lot of tattoos and and shoot heroin and 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 rebel against those those authoritarian in, uh, influences from our childhood, that's also inauthentic. So there comes a time, and it's usually brought on by a crisis, like a car accident or a death of a loved one, where we have to sit down and decide who we want to be. So, anyways, attachment theory, you you know very well, but I think that that's a core um, component of authenticity. The second part is atonement or, or at one minute, which is just releasing your mind's resentments about your past it, because you can't change the past. So, you know, if you came home and saw your child 
sitting on the couch trying to shove a square peg into a round hole, you would stop him. And yet this is what your mind does all day long. Your mind is sitting there doing these woulda, coulda, shoulda, didn't. Oh, if I had gotten into Yale. Oh, if I had married this person. Oh, if I hadn't taken that job. Oh, if this hadn't happened or that hadn't happened. Oh, if I won the lottery yesterday, then I'd be happy. This is all, you know, your mind is, is causing your misery by making these hypotheticals. So atonement means cleaning up the past. And um, it's Lily Tomlin who puts it best when she says, Says, forgiveness means giving up all hope of having a better past. So um, the atonement portion is just accepting your whole life. And if your mind is saying this shouldn't have happened or that shouldn't have happened, it just means that you need to forgive people. So if you want to end your suffering, you just forgive. It's, it's super simple. There's no plan B. You just have to find a way to say, I'm releasing my right to resent that something happened. So that's atonement. The third part is attunement, which is being able to connect with others, you know, like you and I do in the office with um, the same facial affect, you know, showing empathy and making eye contact. And that's why I don't even like doing therapy by, by Skype. I really feel that there's a lot of um, information that takes place when two people are in proximity. And, you know, you really need to sit there with people and have your emotional um, experiences validated. So um, attuning to people and being able to attune to other human beings is a core part of uh, authenticity. The fourth part is presence. And that's just not letting your mind drag you into the past or project you into the future. And the tools I use for this are meditation and uh, yoga. And then the fourth part, or I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, the fifth part is congruence, which is deciding who you want to be and what your life should resemble, and then having the tools to engender that. And, you know, um, we live in an incredibly luxurious, privileged society. We're not running from lions and tigers. We don't have a lot of imminent threats. We have roofs over our heads. And, you know, yet there's so many people who um, are depressed or stressed out, and they just are kind of following that um, prescription of our society, they're on autopilot. They're like, oh, well, when I become president, I'll be happier. Or when I vacation here or when I buy this handbag, I'll, you know, and they have all this stuff going on in their head and they don't realize that those things actually don't engender happiness. So congruence means having your outer world match your inner world. And I think um, the quote that starts the book by Andre Gide will inform everyone what I mean. It is better to be hated for what you are than to be loved for what you are not. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's authenticity to me. Attachment, atonement, attunement, presence, and congruence. Yeah, I love that quote in the beginning as well. Um, and how about in chapter four, the myth of romance, right? Because yeah. one of the things that you're talking about when we are studying attachment and our need for love and connection and, you know, communication about, you also talk about how we can kind of get trapped a little bit in the cliches and, you know, what we think love is supposed to be and what it's supposed mm -hmm. to look like. And if we don't have that and what that does. So, um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about this myth of romance. Sure. There's a book by Denis de Rougemont called L'Amour et l'Occident, Love in the Western World. And Robert Johnson, who's a Jungian out of, um, uh, Houston, if I'm not mistaken, uh, wrote a book called We. And, um, you know, romantic love as we know it is esoteric to Western civilization. It's about 700 years old. It's based on the myth of Tristan and Itzold. Um, most of the world for the history of humanity gets married for financial reasons. You know, your father has uh, two goats and a rabbit, and my father has uh, five sheep and a herring farm. And they say, hey, wouldn't it be great if our kids uh, started a family? And that's how marriage has taken place <laughs> throughout the history of humanity. So you were the first culture that gets married essentially for lust. And we have to understand that lust dies. So they're not, you know, I can give you the, the, the statistics for sex practices for, for um, adults, well, you know, in relationships. And it's just very obvious that, you know, there's a, there's a, a mating period, there's a courting period. And then, you know, if you get married because you think you're going to have the best sex of your life with this person, which is what happens when you watch the movies, because that's how all uh, romantic movies end 
end, they end with the couple, you know, uh, consummating their relationship by fornicating. And then, so in our minds, when we leave the movie theaters, we think, wow, that's the acme of intimacy, you know, having sex. And really, uh, you know, as I say in the book, there, there's really no relationship between sex and love. And, and, I, and I use, <laughs> you know, if Martians came down from another planet and, and went to Google and, and put sex into Google, they would think that we're very confused as human beings because, you know, nobody watches pornography and says, oh, that's so sweet. Those people, they really love each other. You know, so we, we have this fiction in our head that sex and love are related in some ways. And, and when you really deconstruct it, you know, there's a lot of uh, other things going on. Um, and I can actually, if you want to get into a really uh, provocative discussion, I'll, I'll even go so far as to say there's a distinct possibility that passion is based on dysfunctionality. It, 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 do, does that register with you? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's a distinct possibility that what we consider to be passion in our society is fundamentally based on psychological dysfunctionality because there's a in, there's a incredible power hierarchy. You know, there's a wealthy man and a young woman who needs this or that, or there's a very um, smart woman, and then there's a a, a hefty or wonderfully uh, some other type of of guy, you know, like with an age difference. And it's just fascinating to me, the things that we (laughs) consider as a culture to be love. I mean, I'm trying to think, I just watched a movie uh, with uh, Sam Elliott. Uh, it's called The Hero or Hero or something like that. And he's 75 years old and she's 35 years old. And it's a love story. And, you know, the things that we're, that again, that we see in, in, in popular culture, in, our, in the literature, in songs, in, on television shows and, and movies that constitute love, are really absurd, and if you try to if you try to do those same things in your own life, it's going to end up in disaster. It has no all those things have no correlation with with intimacy. And you know what what I was saying in the beginning was, you know, it's shocking to me that we don't have classes in our school system. Yeah, uh, you know uh, how to be intimate, how to how to hold hands, how to make friends. You know, you don't need to. Half the kids in America don't need to learn math, biology, chemistry, and all the other stuff that you know that they that bore them out to out of their minds you know but they do need classes on like how to make eye contact with people how to say uh, you know how to say hello things like that so again um, I'm fascinated by the myth of romantic love and then all the things that uh, cause people to you know um, become codependent codependent think that there's a, a missing part of them, a soulmate out there, and that uh, once they find this person, they'll be healed forever. And uh, yeah, I've been studying this stuff for a long time, and um, it never ceases to fascinate me. Yeah, I remember attending a workshop on codependency, and uh, the teacher said, if you listen to any love song, it's like, it, it, it totally explains codependency, you know, I mean, like these love songs are kind of, you know, saying like, I can't live if living is without you, you know, like the teacher played a bunch of these different songs, That's you know, great. like you're all that I am. But right. and, uh, the teacher had said, you're going to start listening to love songs in a totally different way after this yeah. lecture. And uh, yeah, they're just, you know, with that romantic love and what we're exposed to and what we're watching with love stories and what we're hearing. And of course, nowadays, you know, with social media, you know, so many people are looking at other people's lives on Facebook. And again, that's creating kind of an altered reality of everybody looking so happy and look at our beautiful family pictures and, oh, look at these great things that I did for my child's birthday party. And, you know, and then those same people come in and they're like, I'm fucking miserable, (laughs) miserable in my life. My relationship's breaking down. You know, it's like this facade. The quote is that, um, you know, stop trying to measure your insides with other people's outsides. Right. Because we see on, you know, in America, we're always taught put put your best foot forward. So you don't put your whole self up on Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook. I mean, and basically, and this is what I talk about in the book. This is another polemical thing. I mean, I think that capitalism corrupts a lot of these things. Like the Internet was a fantastic thing 20, 30 years ago. It was all about like libraries and having knowledge. And now it's about selling stuff. Ninety percent of the things that I that see that that go into my eyeballs 
there's somebody trying to sell me something, whether it's their online coaching course or their jewelry line or some kind of thing that they think that I might need. But really, you know, the internet has been corrupted and I don't know what's going to happen with it. Uh, you know, if we're going to have to pay for things so that we don't have this incessant advertising and this barrage of, you know, most of the emails and phone calls that I get are like pre-recorded spammy crazy stuff trying to give me online cruises even that even when i've gone on the no don't, do not call registry i don't even know how people are getting my phone number or my email addresses but most of the time 90 percent of the things that i receive through technology is somebody trying to extract money from me in some way mm-hmm yeah, and that's a very odd way of, of uh, as a civilization uh, of of interacting. You know, as I said, you know, we need to we need to th throw a frisbee on the beach. We need to we need to to interact in new ways besides exchanging money. Yeah, I also you know, and kind of talking about authenticity. When I was on your website and part of your blog, you had a a little moment about the Chelsea Handler syndrome and how she can kind of bring people, you know, testing boundaries and making yeah. it so uncomfortable with authenticity that she shows. So can you talk a little bit about that too? You know, it's so funny. I, I, I adore her. I really love her because she says things that I think she's really bright and she knows that they're provocative, but she has this kind of um, odd way of making everyone around here feel uncomfortable by saying something that's usually inappropriate. Sometimes it has to do like um, there was a, one show where she was in India and uh, the, so the, there was someone who obviously learned English from the British Empire and said, and they said, oh, that's naughty. I mean, and they were talking about something like a little girl. And then she just turns to this person with a total deadpan and says, oh, when we say naughty, we mean anal. And, 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 you know, like that, and she's, and then she just walks away. And so this person, <laughs> you know, is just like, what the, f like, what, why, like we're, you're filming me, you know, and, and they blush because, you know, we're talking about like uh, gummy bears and all of a sudden, like you bring in anal sex. And so like that, it's very interesting, the, the, or her ability to, um, <laughs> to just provoke consciousness around uh, around language. So yeah, I um yeah, Chelsea Handler syndrome. It's just um being um uh, oblivious to the fact that you're making other people uncomfortable. So, you know, I mean, authenticity is not, um, you know, without its uh, uh, fallibility in some ways. You know, you can be authentic and you can just put, be, you could be an authentic asshole. And, uh, and that's the point I was trying to make, I think. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to be authentic and just spout things out of your head and, uh, and, and just, you know, whatever comes into your mind, that's not authenticity. Authenticity, uh, you know, also means knowing how um, you want to engender loving relationships, so you embody compassion. And you know that again, when you look at television, um, all narrative theory is based on conflict. So you know her television show, I and mean, I assume it's, it's, it does well. It's based on in conflict. I mean, she gets the money that she may, gets because she's she, she's provocative. And, you know, if she just walked up to people and said, "Oh, that's a lovely cat. Like, how did you groom it?" and da 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 da, da I think her ratings would be a lot less. So again, these are all things that I like to analyze in the book. What we consider to be normal and as you were talking about the songs, as I talk, uh, I analyze movies, you know, um, there's a lot of things going on in there that we consider to be normal that could actually be completely dysfunctional and maladaptive. Right, right. Now, moving uh, to a little bit in a different direction, um, I want to talk a little bit about resentment and forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you talk about that also in the book and really trying to, I think that you'll find too, that a lot of places where people do get stuck are either stuck in the past or stuck on somebody that they've needed to forgive, somebody that hurt them or trying to forgive themselves and how resentment kind of follows that and how to release that through forgiveness. So I was hoping you can talk about that. Sure. Well, it's ironic. Again, if you look at consciousness, and this is what I study, your mind was built to create 
resentments, expectations, fears, and prejudices. And you wonder why, you know, there's so much depression and anxiety, because, you know, we all experience traumas, as you said, from childhood, and our mind, again, creates resentments. Wow, uh, that shouldn't have happened. So anytime you hear this, that should or shouldn't have, uh, in terms of, oh, yeah, my, I, I, you know, I, my parents got divorced and I went to boarding school, there's judgments in all of these things when, you, you know, you really have to be impeccable about your the the way you communicate because you're 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 enrolling people in your own victimhood when you you know put those judgments out there and by the same token uh, you know you shouldn't go to the other extreme and be narcissistic and and you know try to be the hero of every story but to have a a, a balanced and um, you know more or less objective way of talking about your past rather than you know this continual uh, stream of resentments, you know, oh, you know, I'd be better if this didn't happen or that didn't happen. So, you know, the quote from, uh, well, it's, it's given to Carrie Fisher, but I think other people said it before, you know this, um, resentment is like poking yourself in the eye and waiting for someone else to go blind. Resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for someone else to get sick. So it's, it's fascinating to me because I, I, I didn't, I don't think I, I was able to go into this in the book, but if you talk to me privately, which I assume we're doing now, even though this is a podcast, I'll, I'll use the example of suicide. And I'll even go to um, Hamlet, and I'll say suicide always involves two people. And what the person who's killing themselves is doing or trying to kill himself, and, and, I, and you know, this is, this, you might not agree with me, but if you don't have pancreatic cancer and are dying some painful death, which I consider to be like self-euthanasia, if you're putting yourself out of your own misery, then most of the time I look at suicide and I think that this person is trying to say to someone from 30, 40 years ago, you did not love me in the manner that I deserve to be loved. And again, the central premise is that we want to be loved unconditionally. And when we were children, you know, people made fun of us. Teachers failed us. Our older brother pushed us into the mud. Shit happened. And our mind you know, did this crazy thing at the time. So the way we clean this up is to forgive everyone unequivocally, because forgiveness does not mean that you're condoning your older brother's behavior or your teacher's behavior. It doesn't, you're not condoning anything. You're releasing your right to resent that something happened. And again, the irony is, is that your mind creates these resentments because it thinks if I create these resentments, then that'll help um, stave off potential future traumas. But, and it does, it works. It's a great system, <laughs> but you know, you're, you might also um, be avoidant and you might not be um, showing up for the relationships that'll nourish and nurture you now as an adult. So you have to accept your entire past and everything that brought you to this moment in time and forgive everyone and just say, just, you, you, you know, the Hamlet, um, uh, when Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come up to him, he says, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So instead of looking back as, in, as your brother pushing you down in the mud and that's the most terrible thing and, you know, uh, I had to go through hell and back again and this, this was bad and it was so traumatizing, you know, it is what it is, as Miles Davis said, but whatever happened in the past is gone. And so the only thing that exists is your story about it. And it behooves you to um, just tell it as uh, plainly and uncharged as possible, because all of those resentments are the cause of your own suffering. And if you're not willing to forgive somebody, that just means you're not done suffering yet. Mm. And this kind of goes into your chapter, how to own your your life. life. And, um, you know, you give an exercise and you ask your readers to please try, please try this exercise on for size. It's on page 144. You want people to find a mirror, look into your own eyes in the mirror and say the following. I am supposed to be me. I am supposed to look exactly as I look. My life is supposed to be exactly the way it is. Ooh, I can feel some people having some resistance there. And my childhood was supposed to transpire exactly <laughs> as it transpired. 
So, wow, talking like, about ownership yeah. and talking about acceptance. I mean, really, what all of those things is just accepting what is. There's a beautiful quote by Eckhart Tolle. He says, you either accept your life or change it. Any other um, possibility is, is, is insane. And, it, you know, you either, you either accept your life or you change what you can, you change what you can or you accept what you can't. And then if you don't, if you're complaining about anything that you can't change, that's a definition of insanity. So, you know, this owning your life, I, I you know, I say in the book, why not? Like, why, like, like, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's an extreme, um, intellectual exercise for someone like me even to say, you know, I had my face blown off my head when I was 18 years old. So yes, it, you know, it took me 25 years to get to the point where I was able to say, I'm supposed to have these scars on my face. I'm supposed to have these scars on my leg. But you know, that's, that's how we walk through the fire by owning who we are. You, if you can't change it, you, <laughs> why? it's so absurd to fight against. It's like me saying I should be seven feet tall and be playing for the Knicks. You know, I'm not seven feet tall. I'm six feet tall and I suck at basketball. I'm never going to play for the Knicks. And so if I sit there crying all day about not playing for the Knicks, I'm only causing my own suffering. Right. Right. Exactly. And, and also on, you know, the next page, you have talked about that the average human lives 27,375 days. Mm-hmm. And this reminded me of the movie. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but I think it was, I think Justin Timberlake was in it. It might've been called time, but basically where, when you're born in this, this reality that you have the amount of time mm-hmm. pretty much like programmed into your arm. So you can see on a daily basis, how much time you have left. You can yeah. borrow time from other people, but you know, even, even a statistic like that on average, that's how many days that we have, you know, and I was reading that. I'm like, gosh, that's really not that much. You know, and if we really brought even more of that into our awareness, you know, and know. had that time ticker on our arm to say, OK, this is what I have. Our choices, I believe, would be so much different. I think that we would really live life in a completely different way and really maximizing. Yeah. yeah, I have all these exercises in the book. I mean, there's um, I quote uh, Ken Dykewald, who says that the the vast majority of human beings who have walked the planet Earth never reach the age of 40 years old. And in America, because of, you know, um, the incredible sewage uh, system that we have and, uh, you know, toilets, that toilets double the lifespan uh, in one generation. So we, we can expect, you know, if we if we play our cards right, the average person, I think it's in our 80s or something like that. And, and you know, um, it, by the same token, it is you know, not eternal, you know, you're, you were non-existent for millions of years, uh, you're going to be non-existent. So, you know, the way to think about our daily lives, um, is that they are finite. And for me, I always ask, you know, what do you want it to say on your tombstone when you're going about your day? Do you want it to say, um, you know, he was right. Cause you, he won this argument or richest guy in the cemetery or, you know, travel to wherever, I mean, all the things that we think about when we're sitting, well, I think, I'm sorry, all the things that we talk about when we're sitting in cafes, meeting people, you know, uh, a lot of stuff is just bullshit, you know, and what we need to do, because for me, any sane person, when they think about their tombstone, they want it to say beloved. They want it to say, you know, loving wife, loving husband, loving mother, loving father. And yet in our daily activities, we're so selfish and myopic and misguided. And we just think, oh, if I get this thing, I'll be happy. Or if I, you know, attain this uh, level of power, I'll be happy. But our minds are hedonic treadmills and happiness does not, you know, um, come like that. So like, we really need to re-envision our whole society and our whole way of, of interacting with other humans. Great. And as we're wrapping up here, too, I wanted to bring our listeners to your website and also let them know that you do hold public classes, you have DVDs, you do online coaching, you have a private practice. So you're pretty busy. Um, and was wondering if you'd just like to let people know about all the different things that you are involved in. Because you have some things coming up in 2018 around the time that uh, this podcast will be out there and live to the world. 
So I love teaching at the Esalen Institute. I teach a class called Cultivating Meaning and Happiness Through Mindfulness and Yoga, and encapsulates all the things that we've discussed today in my book. Um, as I said, um, authenticity to me is our best shot at happiness, being able to show up in the present moment and accept the pains and also accept the, the joys and happiness. So um, I teach a, a course that's very um, comprehensive, uh, and uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just full of love and laughter, and it's an amazing place, and I'm just blessed that I get to teach there. And then I have the five DVDs, Mindfulness for Depression, Mindfulness for Anxiety, that are all um, uh, free on Amazon Prime. Uh, and the book is out and I've been interacting with people. People have been calling and writing nice little notes. You know, I'm very blessed and honored that I have people like Sting and Marianne Williamson and Michael Beckwith and Jack Cornfield and Daniel Pinchbeck and Noah Levine who, and Jai Utah, all the, like 40 people read the book and they just started calling me up and, uh, and it's been just, uh, you know, the, 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 I don't know. I'm just very, very, very honored. All right. Well, thanks, Ira. It was really great talking to you. And again, for our listeners, the book that we were talking about today is How to Survive Your Childhood Now That You're an Adult, A Pathway to Authenticity and Awakening. IraIsrael.com is where you can find more of this information. And uh, thanks so much for being with us. I had a great time. Thank you, April. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. If you want more information about our films, visit our website, path11productions.com, to purchase DVDs or to rent and stream each film. You can also find our trilogy of films on iTunes, Amazon Prime, and Gaia.com. You can still use our smartphone app for both Android and iPhones. Just search for Path 11 in the Google Play App Store, or if on an iPhone, look for Path 11 in the iOS App Store. Catch you next time!